All right, and so we're going to start this discussion on chapter six, this concept of methods. Um, I always like to start a lecture with why the concept is important. You know, yesterday I think I failed you a little bit because I started doing a coding demonstration and I didn't really explain the why. Like the why is always the most important piece. Um, I remember when I was a student, um, I, I I never understood. Sometimes I was just doing it because I was being told I had to. Um, and I don't think that's a good answer. I think you should understand why you're studying loops. And I think you should understand why you're studying if statements and why you're studying C sharp and all this kind of stuff. So, so why do we study methods? And a lot of the why behind this stuff is just because they're just foundational to code. Like if you break down what is programming, like forever, historically, programming can be bro broken down into like kind of two pieces. You've got your data, AKA your variables, and your behaviors. In other words, what the application can do. And, and behaviors is a synonym for, for methods. Right, so just even going back to programming in the early days, you've got data and you've got behaviors, what the program can do. So, so that's kind of one answer is that, you know, why, are, why is it important to, to study methods? And because it is just a foundational piece to coding in any language, any language that I've ever studied. Okay, if you ever come across a language that doesn't have methods, or functions or whatever you want to call it they're basically the same thing you know you let me know if you come across a, a one without okay because I, I haven't yet um, another way to answer that question of why um, is because I've sat in many of meetings with employers of our graduates and if you didn't know once a year well, actually twice a year. Twice a year, we go to industry and we have them look at our curriculum. And we say, critique our curriculum, make it better. We do it once in the fall, we do it once in the spring, okay? In the fall, it's with employers in the industry and in the, in the spring, it's with our alumni, right? So we kind of get two perspectives. We get the perspective of people who've never been to Rankin before, and we get the ones that are like three years graduated, two years graduated, one year ago, that kind of thing. I sit in these meetings with employers and, and whatnot, and they say, one of the most important skills in coding is, you could call it efficiency, but but really it's getting reuse out of your code, right? You don't want to code the same thing over and over and over again. You want to code something and reuse the code. That's that concept right there of coding something and reusing it, you know, that is one of the principles code reuse is one of the principles of object-oriented programming c sharp is what's called an object-oriented language and therefore it's like a foundational principle meaning critical part of object-oriented languages is this concept of code reuse why is code reuse so important for that efficiency that i mentioned earlier code something once and then reuse that code many times. So employers say that this code reuse is really important. Okay, I've sat in many meetings and they're always like talking heads, they're always saying the same thing, code reuse. One of the first tools that you will learn to make your code reusable is a method. Okay, so I can answer the importance of why 
methods are important is just saying, look, hey, it's foundational. You're, you can't avoid it. It's inevitable like an array. Okay, you will interact with methods. If you're a coder, you have to do this. But I would also say it is one of the foundational ways that we uh, write code in a way that we can reuse our code. And so for those two reasons, uh, hopefully you understand the why this is important. Now, uh, there's a great exercise. Some of the exercises that, that we've done in this class, I, I do very intentionally to have you write some inefficient code, right? And the perfect lab that, that I wanted to kind of start with to show how a method could be used is this lab that, that we did a couple chapters ago with um, is a little game, rock, paper, scissors. And so I had all of my students kind of code this. And the way this game works, essentially, is you let the user pick from these buttons, rock, paper, scissors. Let's just click rock. It says you pick rock, computer pick rock. So basically a tie, so no, no winner. Let's choose rock again. Uh, I chose rock, computer chose scissors. Uh, you would think that player score would go up in that case. Let's do the third round, and after all three rounds, it shows you the ending score, right? So the, the instructions for this didn't say that you had to update the player score and computer score every button click. Uh, and so some of you did. Some of you did update those labels every button click. Some of you did not. Either way was fine. There's no right or wrong answer. But you can kind of see here, user chose rock. The computer picked those things. And, and there's kind of your output. Uh, the player should have won once, so that would be, I, I suppose, a bug. But this, the way that most students code this is with very repetitiveness, right? The, lots of repetitiveness. And so if I kind of glance at this particular solution, we have one button click here, another one here. We've got three button clicks, right? And we have a few variables to keep track of a few different things. These variables are what we call class scope. The benefit of class scoped variables we've learned is that they can span all of our event handlers. Right now we've got three event handlers. Those event handlers are your button clicks. Okay, so these variables can work with all of our event handlers and all of the methods we're going to write. Okay. So, you know, you might want to use the, the term global scope. I don't like that in this, in this context um, because there are more quote unquote global scoped variables than this. Um, so instead, I would just say this is scoped uh, to the class. Uh, there's actually a scope called internal that's kind of there by default. That's not too important. I just call it class scope. I think make, calling it class scope makes sense to people because they're declared right underneath the class. Okay. And they can, again, they can span all of your button clicks. Now, if I look at any one of these, so we've got three button clicks, we've got some class scoped variables. And if I look at this rock, we make a variable called round count go up by one. And here we've got this else if, this outer else if to basically keep track of the round count. If round count is one, we do some if else's to see what did the computer choose. The computer chose a value one, two, or three. And based on that computer choice, we know what the computer chose. If round count is two, we have the same repetitive code. Otherwise, if it's three, you'd have the same repetitive code. And, and we do some outputting. So we're, we're going to uh, output some results with, uh, you know, who won the game. Did the, comp did the player win or did the computer win? Right? Um, 
Otherwise, there's this outer else, and if I see what that's linked up to, um, this outer else is like, okay, if it's not round one, it's not round two, it's not round three, reset everything, right? So if it's round four, you kind of reset your controls and start over is, is what that looks like to me. Okay, so even within this one event handler, we've got some repetitiveness. Um, if you go into this other event handler, you essentially see the same thing. This is the same code written maybe just a little bit differently to account for the fact that the user clicked paper, right? And you're going to find that same repetitive code in here. Okay, so what you can do when you find the same code repeated over and over and over, there's an acronym that, that's kind of fun to, to hear for the first time, uh, is that you want to keep your code dry, okay? And, and what dry stands for is don't repeat yourself, right? If you're finding your code repeating, don't do that. Right? And one of the tools that we're going to learn to keep our code dry is this concept of a method. So what I would do here is I would, I would rewrite this code, which you would say refactor. I would refactor this code to use a method instead. Okay, so, so let's kind of do that. Now, keep in mind what's different between all these three button clicks a lot of the code is going to be the same. The one thing that's going to be different is the button that's clicked. Is it the rock button? Is it paper? Or is it scissors? Right? So um, I'm going to write a method as a code demonstration and part of this lecture to, to help me rewrite this code so I'm not repeating myself. It's going to be much cleaner, more efficient. Okay. Um, Looking at this, right, this is a, what's called a, an event handler. You've heard me say that a couple of times. An event handler is a method. An event handler is a method specifically that responds to an event. An event is just something interesting that happens on your, on your uh, application, okay? Anything can be an event. Anything can be an event. So something interesting is a very generic way of describing an event, but anything can be an event. I can think of like Google and like, you, you know, you type in do a barrel roll. You ever done that on Google? Do a barrel roll and Google spins around. Or what are the other ones like? Zerg rush. Zerg rush and, and something happens on Google. And so those are unique events, at least they used to be on Google.com. Okay. I've used websites before that had um, the Contra code built into them. What was the Contra code for my gamers out there? Someone knows it. Contra code? The Konami code. What did I call it? The Contra code, the Konami code. It was used in Contra, but it was used in other video games as well. Okay. In other words... Atticus started saying up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, select, start. That was a cheat code in Nintendo back in the day when I was growing up, right? I was going to my Nintendo, plug that in, you get 100 lives in Contra. Okay. I've been on websites before that that triggers an event. You go on your keyboard, up, up, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, enter, enter, boom. That causes something to occur. Okay. So an event is something interesting that happens in your software, like a button click, okay? An event handler, line 181, is an event handler, is a method that responds to the event. Okay, why do I point that out? Well, we can even look at these event handlers, since they're methods, and we can, we can actually break them down into these pieces, okay? These are some new keywords that we're all going to need to begin to get familiar with. Okay, so these are new keywords. Put these on your radar, put these in your notes. These keywords are things you're gonna to need to know. 
So looking at line 181, we got this keyword private. The other one that you're going to see here is public, right? So private versus public. These are more or less what I consider to be security mechanisms, okay? Which one do you think is more secure, private or public? Private. Private's going to be more secure, okay? Technically, what those are called, I call them security mechanisms, but they are called access modifiers. Access modifiers. And what access modifiers do is kind of control what areas of the code can work with this method. Okay, private access modifier is more secure, so it's pretty locked down. Turns out that, um, you know, private can only work with this form, right? So if I have a, a private method, that private method can only work with this particular form. But if I had multiple forms, you know, the other forms could not work with that private method. So you can kind of see how that locks down the code from a security standpoint. It's basically, hey, if I've got, you know, and you've all been on software and you close one form and another one opens. So you can have multiple forms. And, and private says, nope, only this form can work with this code. The other one is public. And if you might guess, that's a little bit more accessible. These are called access modifiers. So new term number one, access modifier. There are others, but for right now, as we're just learning these, private and public. Private is more secure than public. These are what you need to know for now, okay? So when you're, when you're making a method, when you're making your own method, right now we haven't made our own method, that you start with your access modifier. Everyone with me? When you're making a method, you start with access modifier. And what are the two access modifiers? Private and public. Private and public. So access modifier first. Second, we have this thing called a return data type. So if you're looking at the next keyword there in blue on line 15, you see this void, into the void. What is void? Well, first off, let me... We'll talk about return data type, what the keyword return, uh, what does return mean? But we all know data types, right? What are our data types that we've kind of studied so far? Int, floats, strings, bools, chars, right, correct. Those are data types. So we know, we, we at least know, if we don't know what the return is, we know what a data type is. <clears throat> what does return mean? And that's a little bit more complicated, but, but you can think of, of methods with inputs and outputs. Okay? A method is a chunk of code with inputs and outputs. So you don't have to have inputs and you don't have to have outputs. It deals with sending data to the method and sending data out of the method. Okay? So again, if I'm taking notes, I'm going to say, hey, methods have inputs and methods have outputs. And this return data type says, hey, if this method has an output, if the method has an output, because it doesn't have to, if the method has an output, what is the data type of that output? That is the return data type, the, the data type of the output. So data is going to go into the method and potentially go back out of the method. So that's part two. So we're breaking down the parts of a method. After that, after our access modifier we have our return data type and then we have what's called you you've named things before 
you've named your variables before, right? We call those identifiers. And part three is our method identifier. It's the name that you get to call the method. We get to call the method something, right? We get to name our children. We get to name our variables. And now we get to name our methods. Just like our variables have a naming convention, we're going to fall into a naming convention for our methods as well, right? Part four, again, access modifier, return data type, identifier. Part four, is everything including those parentheses. So the parentheses and every side, everything inside the parentheses. Okay, so if I'm gonna highlight part four, is the parentheses and everything inside of the parentheses. This is called my parameter list. More new words, more new programming words. Remember I said methods have inputs and outputs? These are my inputs. The parameter list are the inputs to the method. Now, this is the first time, you know, you're learning about methods and inputs and outputs. So if you see parameters like you do on line 15, I see something separated by a comma and I see something else. Okay? So this method, if I count the number of some things I see, you know, there's two different things there. Okay? So this method has two inputs. Don't really need to get into what those inputs are at the moment. That's not super important. We will get into what those inputs are. And our return data type is void, which means it has no outputs. So void is a keyword meaning no outputs. But it's also kind of common to see this return data type, you know, and uh, I wouldn't expect that to work. But you can, if you're not, if you don't see void there, you're going to see a data type like an int. Right, you're gonna see something like a double, okay? So, again, that's the output and the inputs. All of this is called, like when you create your variable, you declare it. When you create your method, you declare it. So this is a method declaration. These are the different pieces of a method declaration. You're creating a method. A method could have zero, okay, so uh, blue, blue. Let me let me. As far as inputs and outputs are concerned, a method doesn't have to have any inputs and it doesn't have to have any outputs. So it is true that a method could have zero inputs and zero outputs. A method could also have one input or two inputs or three inputs or ten. Some methods have many inputs, so you can have zero to many inputs. When it comes to outputs though, a method could have, and this is, there's ways around this, but that's, that's not where we're gonna start our learning. We're gonna start with our learning of understanding that a method can have zero or one output. And so this return data type is the data type of our one output, if there's an output. 
If there's no output, that's where you see the word void. Void says this method doesn't have an output. Again, all we're doing is like sending data around. You just got to get used to sending data around with these methods. These methods are going to do things with the data that you're sending around. These are the fundamentals of, you know, of working with methods. If I kind of pop open the slideshow, that's where this kind of starts. Those keywords are what I just covered, right? Access modifier, return data type, method identifier, and a parameter list. If you have multiple inputs, those inputs are in the parameter list and they're separated with commas. <clears throat> so if I'm just glancing at this method, what is our access modifier? Private. Private. What is our return data type? Decimal. What is our method identifier? Get discount percent. How many inputs do we have? One. That input is a decimal data type and they're calling it subtotal. Now the inputs, the inputs, when I say inputs, I'm talking about data. We're inputting data into the method or we're outputting data out of the method. So I'm saying inputs and outputs, I'm saying you're sending data in and you're sending data out. So this particular method does send data out. I could tell that because it's not private void, it's private decimal. That decimal is my return data type is what you told me. And if I look in that method, you see the last line says return. The last line says return. It is sending a variable out of the method. That variable has a value in it. It has some number in it, right? So I'm, I'm taking some data in, I'm doing something in there, and I'm sending some data out. Question so far. This is part one of what you have to do to work with methods. The first thing to work with a method is to create the method, AKA declare the method. You can't work with methods before you, de you gotta declare them first. You gotta create them, just like your variables. You gotta declare your variables before you use them. So let's bring it back to our code example with our, with our repetitive code um, allow me to delete this. And collapse this and collapse this. One common question at this point is well where do I declare my methods in my source code and turns out it's pretty flexible pretty flexible in that like well where could I do it well I could go right up to the top of my class and declare it at the top of my class I could go to the bottom of my class and put it in the bot it's got to be in the class okay this, this outer block of code called the namespace, you could think of that like a, a, a folder, if you will. Um, you can't put it in the namespace. You do have to put it in the class. So like the one rule about declaring your methods is they have to be at the class. So I'll, I'll create my method right up here at the top. Different companies tell you to put these in different places. Some companies might say put them at the top. Some might say put them at the bottom of your class. Some might say put them in the middle. There's no one answer that is the right answer. Um, you know, as far as what you do, it's, 
as long as you're consistent, that's the important thing. There's no right answer here. Uh, so um, now because I'm going to be using these variables in my method, I'm probably going to declare my variables first and then underneath those variable declarations, I'll create my method. That way at least I can work with those variables. So I'm not going to put my method right at the top, but I'll put them underneath these variables so that those variables are considered in scope. I'm going to start with the private method and I'm just going to start it off with void and I'm just going to call this determine winner. Okay. We'll change this method as it goes. Um, but when I'm thinking of this problem, I've got these three different button clicks. And literally the only difference between these three button clicks is, well, what button are you, are you, did the user pick? What button did the user pick? So when I'm thinking about how I write this method, I might write this method with one input and that one input is representative of what the user picked. So, well, I could do that with a string. I could, you know, like I could have this one input could be a string for user pick. And if user picked equaled rock in quotes or paper or scissors. And that's, that's my first thought. Now my second thought is, well, I don't want to make it a string because what I do know based on the code that we reviewed earlier is that there's a computer choice and that computer choice is an int. So why don't I just compare ints against ints? Because I'm, I'm thinking that, hey, if I have a user pick and a computer pick, like let's just say if one equals one, else if one you know, is less than two or, or what have you. So I, I'm thinking an int for user pick. And again, what I'm gonna represent user pick here is one equals rock, two equals paper, three equals scissors. Morning. So I now have this method. I'm still going to continue to flush it out. Um, this method takes one input and all that input is, is what button did the user click? What I haven't shown anybody yet, right? What's it called when we're creating a method in code? What, what's the, the new term or you create a method in code, it's called a what? Method declaration. method declaration, right? We're declaring a method. You have to declare the method first. That's what we've done. We've declared the method. Well, part two is then using that method. So this is the method declaration. And part two, this is the method declaration for the rock click, but part two is to call the method. So inside of my event handler, notice I've declared the method outside of my event handler. Okay, you don't declare methods inside of other method declarations, right? I called that a method declaration. It was an event handler. You're not declaring methods in methods, okay? When you're declaring a method, it's a new method and it's declared outside of all the other methods. Okay, so that's why this block of code is outside of this block of code. Okay, but if this block of code is going to use this method, you have to do this calling of the method. Okay. So let me show you how you call the method and you just call it by its identifier. This is determine winner. And then in the parentheses, you have to give, you have to send the data in. So notice I'm calling the method here by its identifier, just like 
I call you by your identifiers, right? You all have names. I call you by your name. I call this method by its name. And I have to, additionally, because this method has this variable that's called a parameter, remember in our parameter list, let me, let me back up and just talk about that variable. That variable is a normal variable. For all intents and purposes, all we're doing is creating a variable. It's an integer data type, so you know what that means. And the scope of that variable is that that variable can be used inside of this method. It's called local scope. So if you're taking notes, hopefully you're taking notes, write that one down. Parameters have local scope. Local scope meaning what? It means it can only be used in that method. This user, this user pick right here, I cannot, I cannot work with user pick anywhere else in my code. I can only work with user pick in between these curly braces. That's called local scope. Now when we create a variable, when we declare a variable inside of those parentheses, that variable, again, it's just a variable. They just give it a special name. They give that variable a special name. It's called a parameter. OK? It's just a special variable. It's, it's got local scope, and it can be used within the method. Yes, sir? Um, you reset it down to the local scope? Yep. Down. Yeah, local scope means that it can only be used within that block of code. And in this case, that block of code is a method. So essentially, all I've done here is I created this thing called the method. This method has one input, which is an integer. And I've called that method, and I'm sending it a number, in this case, determine winner one. You know, you know, let's just, it, you can give it any integer here. I can say 1001. Any number now is acceptable inside of those, inside of that method call. And all I'm going to do now, just as a simple uh, demonstration, I've got this label result down here. Label result.txt equals user pick to string. Who's saying I need your head up and I need your eyes open, please? All I'm doing is I'm taking that 1001, I'm calling the method, and I'm going to put that into a label. Okay? This is the simplest method that I can write that kind of demonstrates declaring a method and calling a method. All right, we run it. It's really not doing anything fancy yet, but it is in fact working. It is declaring a method, calling the method. So let's, let's talk about this just a little bit more and I'm gonna send you guys on a break. Let's look at line 12, let's review. What's that first keyword on line 12, private? What, what is that called? Access modifier. Access modifier. So I want a few more people to interact, so I'm going to ask people to raise their hand. OK? The second keyword on line 12, I'm looking for people that, yes, Nathan, what is the second keyword on line 12? Uh, return data type. Return data type is correct. What do all of you, what have you learned about a return data type? What, what other words do you see there besides void? What other words do you see there, Connor, besides void? Int and object. Int, double, float, char. Those are all data types. You know what data types are. So you either see a normal data type like int, double, float, char, decimal, you guys know those data types. Or you see this other keyword you've never seen before, which is void. What does it mean when you see the word void? Into the void. What does void mean? Um, it means that there is no, um, 
Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. That means this method has no outputs. Methods have inputs and methods have outputs. When you see the word void, there's no outputs of this method. This method just does something and it doesn't send data out of the method. So we've got access modifier, public or private. We've got return data type. It's either void or one of those data types that we know. What comes next? What's that third keyword? I'll take someone raising their hand. Alexis? That's your identifier. You get to name your method. I want to point something out I didn't say earlier. The book uses what's called Pascal casing, right? Our variables used what kind of convention? What kind of convention did our variables use? Use camel casing. So our variables, we are going to camel case. Our methods, they're conventions. So what is a convention versus a rule? A convention is a, a practice, a recommendation. A rule is a must follow. A, a, a convention is a suggestion, okay? Different companies will have different conventions. Determine winner is Pascal, Pascal, Pascal casing. Just means you start with a capital letter and every new word is capitalized as well. Yep. I know it's a convention, but let's say you decided like back then, like in the past, yep. labs and stuff to yep. use like this and just like, or yep. not even cap Good. capitalized at all. What Good. would happen? You well, think? you haven't written methods in your past labs. So I doubt that you've done this. When I'm talking about Pascal casing, I'm talking specifically on methods. Being that this is the first time you've ever seen or written a method, you haven't done it before, right? Uh, your variables though, this is, the, this is the camel casing, this is Pascal casing. Okay. So our method convention is uh, Pascal casing, and yes, just like you got tested on the convention, right? I got like five points on a test that says your variables follow this convention, right? You just took a test where your variables had to follow a convention. It's gonna be the same thing here. Our methods are gonna to have to, in this class, follow my convention. When you go work for your company, you'll have to follow their convention. Might not match my convention. Everyone does it differently. Okay, next question. The parentheses on line 12, and everything in it is called the what? Take a hand. Parameter. You need a new one. Do the same. The parameter. The, um, I have to you got it right, but it's right here on the board. Parameter list. Parameter list. And what do you know about the parameter list? Uh, how many? OK, if we said that the return data type was the outputs, that's what Max told me. What is the parameter list then? Let's get some new hands. Someone else. If the return data type is the outputs, the parameter list would be the inputs. Are either our inputs or outputs required or mandatory? No. You can have zero inputs, you could have zero outputs. You had zero inputs, the parameter list would be empty. These parentheses would have nothing in them. This is an example of zero inputs. Depending on the needs of your method, you could have many inputs. So you could have zero to many inputs. You could have zero or one output. So, so inputs are uh, control Z, Control Z, Control Z. There we go. Inputs are zero to many. Outputs are zero or one. Good. What kind of scope? Okay, this is a parameter list. Really, when, when a parameter list, you just think of it as your list of inputs. Well, what are your inputs? Your inputs are called parameters. Parameters are just variables. Parameters are just variables. If you know what a variable is, you know what a parameter is. Okay, it's just a certain kind of variable, right? 
Think of a variable as a broad category, and this is a specific kind of variable. Okay? The, the, it's a kind of variable because it's scoped uniquely. The scope of this variable is called what? What kind of scope do, do parameters have? Someone raise their hand. Someone else. What kind of scope? Jack. It's called local scope. Meaning what? Jack, can you elaborate? Christian? Yes, Jack got it. Jack got it. He said it's only available in that method. So my, my parameter here is called user pick, and user pick is only available basically from line 13 to line 18. All right, that's a block of code, that's my method. So what I've done in this example is I've taken a piece of data from one piece in my program, right, in this, in this handler, in this other method, I've taken this piece of data and I've sent it to another part of my program, this method. So I'm sending data from one part to another. And that's, that's how software works. You just send data around and you do stuff and then you send data over here and you do stuff. You send data over there and you do stuff and you're converting between data types. I mean, you know, that's a way oversimplification of it, but that's what it is. You're just taking data out of a database, doing something with it, sending it to the front end on the HTML, showing it to the user, letting the user change it, sending it back over to you, changing it again. You're just sending data around. Right? And so that's what's happening here. We're taking this data and we're sending it up. Okay, I'm beating a dead horse. Let's take a break. You guys take 15 minutes and then we're going to continue on this discussion. All right? Woo. Is Andrew in here? Andrew? Yeah, Drew. Okay, back from a little break. Hopefully, feeling a little refreshed. There's a lot to talk about with methods, so um, let's continue. Uh, any guesses if I, on line 28, when I call my method, if I put a decimal point here, any guesses what's going to happen? If I put a 0.5, what's the guess? Yeah, good guess. Why, why did you make that guess? So yeah, coin flip, it's either going to work or it's not. <laughs> Yeah, so where is that data going is the question. Where is that data going? Well, it's going into line 12, into a variable, a.k.a. a parameter, called user pick. What's the data type of user pick? Int. Now does that make sense? Yeah. We cannot send a floating point number into an int. So what happens if I put quotes around this 1001 and turn it into a string? What if I a string that holds the, the number 1001? Well, sure doesn't work. Yep. Yeah. So what if I do convert to int 32 like that? That works. You're converting the string into the int and sending it in. Sure. By the way, convert 2 and 32. 2 and 32 is a method that accepts a string input. Right? You're actually calling a method right there. But we'll, we'll, that's slightly more. We don't need to worry about that. So, point is. That convert class is kind of pre-built, so we can only use the methods okay, that so belong we, to it. If we wanted to make something an int, we wouldn't be able to like convert to determine winner, winner. Right. Yeah, I think he was pointing out that that convert is a method. Oh. Okay. Yeah. The the two and thirty two. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Well, the 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 takeaway that we're we're going to start with is, hey, our data types still have to match. The data that we send 
has to be received by a parameter of a matching type. By the way, you want to get like real deep into the weeds? The data that you send is also given a special name, right? The data that's received is called a parameter. The data that you send is called the argument. That's why there's args with that? R-G-E-H? Args, yeah, I think that's the same thing. I'm trying to think of where you're seeing args. You're right. Well, it's the Line 25. Line 25. Event args. Event args. Um, yeah, typically that is a parameter, but a lot of people use that language interchangeably. I'm just saying you can use that language interchangeably, but m some very technical language is to say, okay, inside these parentheses, these are my parameters. So right here, this is my parameter. The data you send to that, in other case, 1001, you call that the argument. The argument that's sent into the data that's sent into the parameter. But that's that's really not critical for it to work. For what's critical for it to work is to realize, hey, I got an int and I'm sending it into an int. Now it's also the number of arguments have to match the number of parameters. Like if I were to have just for example another one called int computer pick. Well, now I have two inputs. How do you think I need to change line 28? Put a comma and then another number. Yeah, I have to actually provide, if I have two parameters, I need to provide two arguments. So if I did like comma 2002. So the data types have to match. The numbers have to match. And really the, the order of the data types have to match too. Like let's just say I, I change this to a string. Then I have to pass it a string. Right? So if my data types of my parameters go int string, I have to call it int string. Do you think I could call it the other way around? No. I can't call it the other way around. The order of your data types matter. So if I were to say string comma int, okay, that's not going to work. It's just, they just have to match, exactly. They have to do an exact match for now. Of course, it gets more complicated, but that's not where you, you start. So it goes int string, we need to pass it int comma string. Okay, now I'm just gonna flush out this example. Um, so I know this lecture is going on, but I think, I think it'll help you if you zone in and pay attention. Um, so if I'm just gonna kind of finish this coding example and stop focusing so much on the different pieces here, I'm going to send in the number one to my method called determine winner. That represents that they clicked rock, right? So the number one here goes into my parameter called user pick. Instead of just spitting that out, <clears throat> let's generate a, a computer pick. So I'll say int computer pick equals rand dot next one comma four. So this is my random number generator. This generates a one, two, or three, not inclusive of the four. I wish it was not that way, but that's how it works. Um, so I could say, you know, if user pick is one equals uh, computer pick tie, else if user pick is well less than uh, if one is less than two or three so uh, so 
So you, you really just don't want to say if user pick equal, uh, let me think about, it's been so long since I've solved this. Um, if user pick else if user pick is one and computer pick is two. So the user picked rock, computer picked paper. Else if user pick is one and computer pick is three. User picked rock, computer picked rock scissors. User wins. Okay, now let's continue on. Else if user pick is two, computer pick is one, user picked paper, computer picked rock, user wins. Else if user pick is two, and computer pick is three. Uh, this is always so weird to think about. Uh, user picks rock, paper, computer picks scissors, computer wins. This is my first draft. I'm sure there's a more efficient way of coding it, but this is my first draft. Else if user pick is three and computer pick is one. I got the tie here for the oh, okay. if they're equal. Yeah, I yeah, started off yeah. if they're equal, yeah. two and two, one and one, three and three. Um, so now we've got user pick, scissors, rock, computer wins. Um, I think our last combo, I think our last combo is user pick of three scissors, computer pick, paper, user wins. Okay. And so we got one method. It kind of accounts for a tie, one, two, all these different scenarios. Um, hey, Mr. G. Hey. So do, do all, let's say, let's say you have like, I don't know, six label results or something. Do they all count as like one output? Six label results? I don't know, like let's say you had multiple labels uh -huh. that, uh, that display something when you press and calculate or something. Does that, does that count as one output? Or that, does that count as six and would it work? You could go either way with that. Either way could be configured. Yeah. Okay, so we generate, okay, so here we call the method, we have a user pick. In this case, the only user pick we're sending in is one, representing rock. Um, and to update who wins, you just have player score and I'll call it comp score, rename like comp score. Um, so here, what do you do with tie? Well, either tie, you know, you could not do anything. Um, so let's do label result dot text equals tie. Label result dot text is comp score plus plus label comp score label comp score dot text equals comp score to string. So a little bit of outputting here, outputting who wins and outputting the computer score. Uh, label result uh, 
uh, user. Wait a take. It's not called user score. It's player score. Player score plus plus and label player score dot text equals player score to string. I have a question. Yes. Can you make another method that does that? Yeah, you could you could extract that into its method because you are right because we're getting some repeat code here. Yeah. So you would have method calls with yeah you could you could add another. Um, that's a great that's a great observation. So um, keep your code dry, right? Don't repeat yourself. And clearly, we are doing one of these two operations. Um, so if I just take that little chunk of code and I say here, and I say here. And I take the user wins, and I paste it here, and I say here. Okay, so now I've got my one method called determine winner. This doesn't uh, meet all the requirements yet, but and it's only on rock. Computer wins, user wins, computer wins, computer wins. Tie, neither go up. My user is falling behind. <laughs> computer is playing ahead. Oh, here we go. Oh. <laughs> We're off to the races. It's the thing about odds. When it's 50 50. You know, if you. What do you mean it's not really? No, but player, computer, one's going to win or the other. Okay. At the end of the day, after 107 clicks, we have a player score. You just made a cookie clicker video game. Here we go. Moving on. Now we got to call paper. Now we've got this method called user pick. And I can go in here and delete my code. Da, 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 da. Granted, I'm not meeting all of the requirements. But now I just call determine winner and I pass it a value of two, representing representing the paper. And now we've got paper That's working. Solid right? And we're cooking and we're cooking and we're cooking. And now we get to replace all this code with a single method call. Voila. And determine winner three. And I tell you what, Connor, I appreciate that. As long as I've been coding, I don't think I've ever had a student say, wow, <laughs> as a result of my code. <gasps> Yay. <laughs> I can't remember when I said that. I must have blanked out. You might have blanked out. I'm going to say, I'm pretty sure you said it. I heard it. He was just so impressed. I'll, there I'll, you go. Yeah, it just blew my mind. It blew his mind. All right. I just suppressed the memory. But do you see now we don't have to repeat our code? And it is wonderful. Now, you know, there's more requirements. And how can you handle those requirements? Well, we do have a round count. Um, so here, round count plus plus. Again, maybe we're going to write some repetitive code that you could segment out. If round count... Um, well, your is four. If round count is four, you know, uh, label result dot text plus equals uh, new line. The match winner is the three round match winner is. if and you know you could just put this right inside of determine winner is what you could do uh, if player score greater than computer score comp score label result dot text plus equals so this, this can all be within yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna move it I'm gonna move it uh, Player, yay, party. The player wins. Explicit. 
Uh, that's just r excitement. Else, the computer will tell you if player score, else if comp score is greater than player score. Computer. Else. Ooh, it's a tie. A tie. Sad face. Okay, so yeah. I don't want to put this in a bunch of different methods, so let's just put it in our one method call. Determine winner. And here, if round count is four, we do this. Else, we do everything else. Else, which is one big else block, and put all of this in our else. And see how now nested. we have some nested ifs going on. We increase our round count if round count is four. And one other thing that we could do in our round count, we could say button, we can disable our buttons, right? We're gonna disable our buttons. Button paper enabled as false. Button scissors enabled as false. Button rock dot enabled as false. Okay, so now we can only play three rounds. Oh, uh, until I round count plus plus else eh, eh, eh. Is me a new creator? I wonder if, if round count is four. Now, I clearly made a bug. That's great. It offers me an opportunity to show you a tool that you, you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Over here on the left, we can insert this fun tool called a breakpoint. This is going to help me debug my code. Instead of starting without debugging, which is what you've probably been doing until this point, this little play button, we've got this little play button, which is debugging mode. So let's go ahead and click on that. Let's click on rock, and that's going to allow me to kind of step through my code. Okay. Okay, it's working. I literally, I just needed to close it and reopen it. So let's get out of debugging mode and just run it again. Click stop, run it again. So um, it is working. It doesn't actually play four rounds, but it's a little buggy because it makes you click four times. I just have to change the order of operations here. User wins, tie, computer wins, three round match winner is a tie. Um, there we go. The rest of that lecture is something that you really don't need for these labs that I'm about to open up for you. Um, so yeah, any other questions on methods before we start looking at some labs?